Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Today is November the 26th, 2017. Um, Thanksgiving weekend. We just had Thanksgiving. How, how was your Thanksgiving, guys? Swell. Great. If I never see another turkey, it will be too soon. <laughs> well, then don't watch Dark Tower. <laughs> Ouch. So, typical Thanksgiving, then. <laughs> My son came home from right. college first time in a couple months. That was very nice. Oh, that's good. Mine did too. He spent two nights and then went back. My daughter did too. Guy, we're old enough to be in the position our parents were when we came home. Yeah, you guys are old. Uh, let's do introductions. Let's start with Kelly and work our way over. I'm Kelly Young. I am the executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. Matt? Hi, I'm Matt. Perfect. Kelly? No, Kelly, we just did Kelly. Uh, I'm, Ke Pete. Oh. <laughs> I'm Pete Rollick. I'm an alcoholic, so that you don't have to be. Hi, Pete. Rich. Hi, I'm uh, Rich Bunting. I'm a Patreon. And uh, Rick. I'm Rick Lay, an obscure writer who nobody reads. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Man, this is going to be a, a I'm happy Mike one. <laughs> the host of this podcast. Rick, weren't you nominated for uh, a major award last year? The Muncie I was. See? People are Muncie, is that like something from Indiana? Yeah. That, uh, in a way, it's, it, it's, it's a pulp uh, magazine award. Maybe Does it, it come in the form of a leg that lights up? It's it's for people who either through scholarship or some other way have contributed to uh, the history of pulp magazines. Mm, nice, but I was only nominated. Okay, well we don't have a guest today, so we're just going to talk about what whatever pops into our heads. So, what popped into Kelly's head was talking about C. Films versus DC TV. So what do you want to say about that, Kelly? Well, what do you we'll have to say for yourself, sir? Explain yourself. Uh, we're just going to jump into the super geeky stuff. We don't have anything Lovecraftian to even grease the wheels a bit towards this. Craft stuff? <laughs> I, I can't the remember. Lovecraft in the DC universe. Oh. I, I thought hey, it would be interesting. If we only talked about Lovecraft, it would get the show would get pretty boring pretty quick. Wait, Kelly, yeah. are you wearing a smoking jacket? <clears throat> he is. Look at him. Yeah, I I told you Mike that hurt. if anyone was going to wear a smoking jacket on this show, it would have to be me. That is some debonair motherfucking shit. Also, it's cold <laughs> as fuck in here, and I told Mike that it was either this or I was going to be wrapped up in a blanket, Pete Rollick style. So. Oh, I remember. <laughs> You know, you know there are some uh, concepts of ancient gods in Justice League, so we could talk about that. Very true. Sure. See, there's our segue. Nice. Yeah, I was just, I was just mentioning it because uh, a number of us have seen the movie Justice League, and I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I was mostly disappointed with it, and I thought it'd be interesting to talk about that and kind of compare and contrast it with what's going on with DC television. Hang on, I'm just looking for the eject button. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so you were disappointed in Justice League? Okay, spoiler free now. So don't you don't have to stop listening if you haven't seen Justice League. But what what were you disappointed in? Oh, well, I'll, I'll talk about the things I liked first. The setup of the characters I liked very much, and I like all of the actors who are playing the characters. I I was. Uh, especially taken with uh, Ezra Miller as Barry Allen, who I came in to not like because I do like the, the TV show Barry Allen. And uh, he won me over in the movie. I thought that he was, you know, he was the shining light of this film. Um, unfortunately, that's not saying much. Uh, because I'm I thought that... Superman, I would say. And Superman, you thought so? Yeah. I, th I thought you were going to say, I thought you said no spoilers. Wow. Everybody knows Superman's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so that's part of the stuff that 
that bothered me was in Batman v Superman, we see the end shot of the casket and the pebbles rising up, and that has no bearing on anything that actually happens next. Uh, apparently, that was due to the fact that they reshot things. Yeah. I've, I've heard that when Whedon took over, they changed some stuff, and it was originally in uh, what's, what's the original? I'm going blank on the original director. Uh, Zack Snyder. Yes, it's, it's Zack Snyder it was apparently in his original screenplay. So we can blame Joss Whedon for this. For that little, I would say that's a minor problem with the movie. A major, yeah. pro- I mean, a major problem is more that the villain was just a CGI generated guy for great fight scenes. He was, Steppenwolf was a bummer, especially on the heels of uh, Hela in the last Thor movie, which cleaved very closely to Kirby's designs for her and looked amazing on screen. I thought that they might have, they might have followed suit with, uh, with Steppenwolf. And instead he looked, you know, he looked bad. Also, mm-hmm. no, no personality. Hela had personality. I mean, you look at Hela's only in a, Really, really, you look at it a few scenes, and this was yeah. one line of dialogue. You get a lot from her. Yeah, and there's a a major plot point in Justice League, which is torn directly from the Lord of the Rings. Hold on, let me get that. Let me get. I, that. I gotta, I gotta mute that. In this <laughs> I told you never to call me here. Um. So there was that. There was also the scene in Batman v Superman where Barry Allen time travels back to Bruce Wayne to let him know some information, which, you know, I assumed was going to be what happened in this film. It it did not. Yeah, I think that Barry Allen's from an alternate future. I wish that, um, you know, quite honestly, I'd like to see them stop trying to do a... a, um, interconnected universe with their films. I don't think Wonder Woman needs to be bogged down with this baggage. This makes for a nice Superman trilogy, for me at least. Um, Superman, Death of Superman, and The Return of Superman. And I think then they should just kind of go off on their merry ways and, and not have to worry about trying to keep some kind of continuity going because you know they're trying to keep continuity going and it's not working now. Well, to, to your point about... Uh... The discrepancy, that's another Josh Whedon, uh, Zack Snyder uh, problem. In the original script, they did explain that, from what I've heard. Yeah, okay. But I think that they're trying too much. They're going right away to huge plot lines. It's like if in the Marvel Universe, we had an Infinity War as the you know, fourth film or something. Well, yeah. the, the the thing is, and, and the what the the continuity problem I have is with Man of Steel. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. You know, because I've 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 complained about this before. So the Kryptonians come down and they start terraforming the planet. Nobody does anything. Wonder Woman, at the very least, should have done something. Right. You think Wonder Woman and Aquaman would at least come forward to, you know, stop the planet from being destroyed because, you know, they live here. I can see Aquaman even. You can make a case for Aquaman not noticing or not caring, but you can't make a – and you can make a case for Flash. He's too young. He's too new. Yeah. You you can't make make a case for Wonder Woman. You can't make a case for Wonder Woman. You can't make a case for Wonder Woman. And, you know, you you, – Given the speed that, that Aquaman is traveling in the oceans, it's hard to, to not make the case for Aquaman. Mm-hmm. You have a similar problem, though, in the Marvel Universe. You've all heard the criticism is, why don't the Avengers intervene in uh, Winter Soldier or Iron Man 3? And just leave it to one hero. Yeah. No, I, I, and I do have that problem. Bless you. Sorry, <laughs> I, I muted. <laughs> yes, I think that's going to be a problem with any standalone film which has something that threatens well, the world. 
we but have the, a world of Well, that's else. the problem. You can't have these giant, you know, and it, it makes it very hard to integrate Suicide Squad into the same in the same universe. You know, an entire city has to be evacuated and nobody shows up. I mean, it's a little ridiculous. Yeah, it. You can't have these giant overt world-ending storylines and not have the rest of the DC universe show up. Though that's been a problem with the comics overall. I rem when I used to read them, we had the same problem. Yeah, it, it, and it's in late. And lately, they've they've gone through a lot of ways of explaining it and telling about how people have been too busy or they're out of town. <laughs> I know the world's in, know the world's ending, but I'm out of town right now. Leave a message yeah, at the yeah. tone. Well, you know, I could buy that with I you. could buy that with something like Winter Soldier because when the crisis develops at the end it's, of that movie, that it's, it's only a couple of hours. It's only a couple of hours. Yeah. But I mean, you know, Iron Man just you know, if 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 if, if I'm I don't know, Captain America, and I just saw that Iron Man's home got shot apart by the Mandarin. I think I got pretty good t enough times, considering when that happened in the movie, to do something. Yeah, you think, you know, and and so you know, this stuff doesn't fit together. It's not well thought out. Now, it can be taken care of with a couple lines of dialogue, but yeah. no. But that's not necessarily an annoying flaw. I mean, that's more of. I mean, you have a point, but the movie can still work as entertainment and be successful. The movie can still work as entertainment and be successful, absolutely. But if you're if you're trying to build a universe, yeah, you have to be consistent, right? I think it also the movie also suffered from uh, this command from on high saying that it had to be under two hours. So there's a lot of scenes I think that could have made the movie better. And, you know, there's a lot of scenes in the trailers that didn't make it. I mean, a lot of scenes in the trailers. Yeah, I, what was this whole this whole thing with, um, with uh, Alfred and something, you know? Yeah. And it's yeah, gone. I knew, I, I knew yeah. you were coming or it, it's you or something like that. That, that was Superman. And that's, uh, I, I just got this all from one podcast which is emergency awesome mm -hmm. that was a problem from uh the snyder whedon turnover the, well i don't they re i think bringing in joss whedon was a mistake they reached out all of superman the whole superman storyline essentially yeah i think bringing in joss whedon was a mistake if if Zack snyder had personal issues and that's very legitimate obviously that he had to leave but so have somebody finish it off with the same vision. Have two competing visions on a movie. Yeah, and I guess the other thing that I um I wish had been made more clear was the relationship between the old gods and the new gods. It wasn't made clear at all. No, it wasn't. And, you know, you would think that either Aquaman or Wonder Woman would have taken two or three minutes to talk about not just who Steppenwolf was, but who the new gods were. And there were, and there were throwaway lines like an Atlantean Amazon war that uh, yeah. he had no context for. Yeah, the Atlantean exactly. Amazon war. Oh, yeah. back in the Stone yeah. Age, sometime. Like uh, it, it happens in the, in the, in the scene where Aquaman is. Uh, the funniest scene was Aquaman. I'll just say that because I don't want to do a spoiler. I was going to say it sounds like Flashpoint. That that does. Well, that might be a setup for Flashpoint, but it's, he says, you know, there is a point where Aquaman says, even though our people once fought in a war, you know, centuries ago. So there was a yeah. reference to that. No, no matter how you feel about Batman v Superman, um, if you watch the theatrical version and then you watch the um, extended version there's a lot of stuff explained that's not explained in the theatrical version the whole story whether you like the story or not i'm not even going to address that right now but the the whole story makes a hell of a lot more sense if you see the extension extended version a hell of a lot more sense and i can only imagine the same is 
Same for Justice League. The problem with doing an extended version is they didn't do, you know, like there's some talk about a Zack Snyder cut. And the problem is since a lot of his scenes got a lot of his scenes that got cut from his vision would cut before they did the CGI for him. Mm. So it's not just that we have a cut scene lying on the cutting room floor. We're going to have to spend some money to put in special effects if you want his cut. Yeah, and can I ask why? Look, you know, we have phenomenal CGI. Mm. We do. Mm-hmm. We have phenomenal makeup artists. And yet, Steppenwolf looks like shit. So did uh, Doomsday. The Smallville Doomsday looked better than the Batman v Superman Doomsday. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of bad CGI, the um, and I found out that it was because Henry Cavill had to come back and and reshoot <laughs> some of his stuff with a beard, and so they did the mustache. Well, I was watching this, you know, on that gigantic screen and going, "What is wrong with his face?" Yeah, that's the first thing you notice when the movie begins. Yeah. See, I mean, and this is this. There are real. I don't understand what the like. You want to get it out in time for this weekend, but you know what? If you make a crappy film, it's not worth it. Well, I think the problem is if we yeah. basically the studio is too involved in the movies, rather than I mean, by Marvel has the guys who are. The Kevin Feige's who are into the comic books in charge. And I think the guys on the TV show are the people who are into the comics. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you got Man of Steel, which some people liked, some people didn't like, okay? But it, it wasn't hellaciously divisive like Batman v Superman was, okay? But let's take Man of Steel, then let's take the extended version of Batman v Superman, then let's take the success that was Wonder Woman. And then if you go to a Justice League, that's a great movie. Everyone forgives Batman v Superman, but there's so much talent in Hollywood. Look, making a Justice League movie, a good one, is doable. This is not some impossible task. You know, you can do it. They just, I don't understand what, what's going on here. Oh, no. With the writers, with, you know, well, like you said, Rick, the studio's too much involved. And also, you know, when they're rushing things, and I'm going to compare this to uh, Civil War. You introduce the Black Panther. He's got a big backstory with Wakanda. But all, all, all you get is, and, and, and this was a smart thing to do, it's an African nation. It's got some high tech, and then you get a teaser at the end for the movie that it's really this vast thing. We're getting Atlantis in this movie. We have no idea from any previous film how Atlantis fits into the world. Right. Right. We should have had a couple of of teaser movies and teaser villains. Yeah. To to build all this up. I mean, like, you know, Sam Mascara is okay because we all saw that in Wonder Woman. Right. Yeah. What I'd like to see is um, it always bothered me in the comics. I don't think Batman belongs in the Justice League because the Justice League takes care of intergalactic problems. And I, I think that he works best in Gotham. And I think that we're seeing these films now. I think the, the superhero movie is dead. And this, you know, probably put the final nail in the costume or in the coffin. Um, and I, I only say that as as a superhero movie, as a comic book movie. This was a pure comic book movie. But you see the success of Logan or this last Spider-Man film or the this latest Thor film. Thor is a buddy cop movie. Spider-Man was a high school comedy. Um, Logan was, you know, a revenge thriller. And it, they all just happened to have superheroes in them. And I think that's the way superhero films are going to have to evolve if they want to stay relevant because we're i think as a as a group of viewers we're done with pure comic book movies i know that i am i i'm definitely feeling the 
the uh, fatigue of of a superhero film. And I love superheroes. So when you get something like this uh, Spider-Man Homecoming or this last Thor film that are so enjoyable, um, it's a real, it's a, it's a refreshing thing. And I think that it would be great to see Batman. Batman should be doing, you know, he should be solving serial killer cases or 007 type situations where, you know, his tech and his detective skills are are pushing the movie forward. Superman should be dealing with these aliens coming down. You know, Superman and Wonder Woman. It'd be great to see Superman and Wonder Woman in a film. All right, I I don't disagree that um, my favorite versions of Batman are when he's in Gotham solving those types of cases, because I I do agree, but. I'll disagree with the other part of that statement that De Batman doesn't belong in the Justice League. If you think that, you haven't read enough Justice League comics because he really does pull his own weight. The cartoon he did, and that. then some. I I know yeah. that he does. He pulls but, his own weight, and then some. But then it it makes his own adventure. It lessens his own adventures. You know how do I how do I get worried about him having to deal with the Joker when he has stopped an alien invasion and saved the world? He didn't do it on his own though. <laughs> well, but he did it with uh, Justice League. There's a great, there's a great two vo two issue series of the Justice League where Starro comes to town, takes over the town, and is told in the system, and they're told no because Starro will take you over, and then Starro will have the Justice League, and the only person who can beat Starro. Is the person that Starro has underestimated, which is Batman. So you know there are these these issues and the, this the basically storylines. It's like it doesn't you know, and it doesn't matter how you know the the, the big debate, Superman versus Batman, who's going to win? And I, I had it with my wife. Oh, Superman will kick Batman's ass. It's like no, Superman will stop, and Batman won't. Mm -hmm. But that's problematic because Batman can beat everybody. Batman has a plan to beat everybody. But that's not you know, the Batman we're seeing in, in these films. Oh, you know? also, also, yeah, it is. That's not the Batman that we saw in the in the in the uh, Christian Bale films. That Batman, there was no way you could beat Superman. But uh, this Batman can. You know, this mm -hmm. Batman is more like the Justice League Batman in the comics. To to get well, the, because this goes back to Kelly's point that the Batman in the Bale in the, in the Christian Bale's films is a is a super spy. Mm -hmm. He's 007 in a bat suit. Mm -hmm. Which I think works. Which you know, yes. He's he's a man, and he's dealing with problems that are difficult for one man to overcome not impossible odds right. can can i get back to one thing kelly said before mm -hmm. uh he said it's the death of the superhero film i think he can have a superhero film if it's in a total science fiction setting like guardians of the galaxy because then you're totally divorced from reality yeah, yeah, I agree with that. The Which Earth is funny. Ground, I, I, I think that's actually the tack that Thor Ragnarok took. Yeah, they just said, you know, we we can't do anything else on Earth. We we we've done that. We've got to go examine the rest of the universe. Yeah, I, yeah. I still have to see that. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just say the, the Earthbound superhero film may be dead, and just to see show you what the problems is with having things on Earth, one of the failures of the Inhuman TV series was all the scenes on Earth. If they had just kept it all in outer space, spent some a lot of money on special effects, and ended it the way it ended, you would have had a better series. It may not have been great, but it wouldn't have been as controversial as their finished product was. So did that series end? I only made it about three episodes in before I said goodbye to it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, this isn't a big spoiler. It, it ends with the Inhumans coming to Earth permanently. 
Can I just say real quick that on a positive note, I I did mostly enjoy the Justice League film, but I think it could have been better. I think we can all agree that it could have been better, and some people think it could have been a lot better. Um, and I don't disagree. I did enjoy it, though. And one of my favorite scenes, I won't give it away, but one of my favorite scenes is the very first scene in the movie. Not, not with the uh, camera film, but when you get into the actual movie with Batman, that bat f first Batman scene. Yeah, that was superb, Batman. That was good, yeah. There was I really power. enjoyed that. Aquaman has an hilarious scene in the movie. Which is had me on the had me laughing loud loud. As funny as anything in Saul Ragnarok. I, I liked Jason Momoa as Batman. A lot of people complaining, and I thought, well, this guy finally looks interesting to me. Yeah, he was very good as Aquaman. And I do like the running joke. You know. Talk to fish. Yeah. But yeah. So all right, so let's compare this to DC on TV. Well, I think the Ricks uh, hit the nail on the head that, you know, they've got the DC writers kind of running the show there, even though it's, they're not writing the episodes. Um, it's one of the DC vice presidents or something that is overseeing everything and putting his stamp of approval on it. So you're getting, um, I think you're getting better storytelling. Uh, obviously they've got a lot more time to spend on a story arc. Uh, and then when they do cross over, it can be as little as um, uh, uh, somebody from Arrow, you know, a minor character just popping in to say hello to somebody from Flash. And, and you get this feeling that, oh, that's right. These people live a city away. And so it feels it feels real, at least to me. Um, Flash has, you know, and they've all had varying uh amounts of success doing this flash if i can is, just jump in real quick and interrupt you one of my favorite examples of that is last season on arrow when uh green arrow calls the central city's uh, police commissioner or whatever he is and the guy says how do i know your green arrow it could be anybody with a voice modulator and and oliver real quick he sends barry a text message and all of a sudden see this whirl in the commissioner's <laughs> office and on and taped to his computer screen. In other words, he's legit. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, and, go on. Well, the, you know, and Flash has had some missteps. Um, as w with any of these kind of superhero stories, it it's always seems a little unrealistic that every problem Barry comes up against is something that can be solved by him just running faster or faster or faster which it doesn't seem like a realistic thing in, in any world. But uh, other than that, I still like Flash well enough. Arrow, um, I've been wavering on a little bit, but I don't know. I feel more comfortable with these people, and it's probably because they have taken the time to build these characters. I feel like I've got a little bit of a history with with Oliver and and Barry and all of these people. I don't know about you guys. I know, Mike, that you haven't been loving the flash i oh i intensely enjoyed that first season of the flash i mean was on the edge of my seat i loved it but yeah i think it's really gone downhill in the last season or so i think what, what matt sorry oh i, I watched a see I, I got through the about the middle of season two and i just couldn't take it anymore no, no. Well, guys, it's got. I think it got too much obsessed with speedsters and the speed force, and it's changed a lot this season because they have a, a very good villain now. Yeah, the first and, three, the first three bosses each, each, in each season, it was a speedster. The first three years, come on. <laughs> well, well, now we have a non-speedster villain in the Thinker, who particularly when they finally got into him, in, the, in the, they had his origin in the. Uh, last week that was one of the best episodes of flash I ever saw mm. okay yeah I've, I've enjoyed this season quite a bit now it's a pure comic book tv show you can see legends of tomorrow that had a lot of missteps in the first season because the villain was a little uneven and it was finding its way but it's got a it's it's got a very nice comedic touch which is you know 
it's funny because in a lot of ways it's like the Justice League film. And yet, I think it's better. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoy Legends of Tomorrow. As I told Kelly, here's kind of a really silly show that I really, really like. <laughs> you know, bad way. I mean, silly in that. You, you, it, I don't think anybody on that show is taking it seriously, and I think it's better for it. Well, yeah, and I think you've hit the nail on the, the head. It's not being, it's not meant to be serious. It's meant to explore some things that are just crazy and probably would not be good television. But we're not making good television. <laughs> we're having fun. And Rich is right. Rich yeah, is what, yeah, say what you just typed, Rich. We'll let you talk. <laughs> You're allowed to talk. You know? <laughs> I, I just want to say that, I, you know, as far as the TV series go, the animated DC universe is much better better done than marvel's animated i think the marvel's live action tv series is much better integrated into its movie its marvel cinematic universe but dc's animated uh movies are just exceptional especially i i really enjoyed the justice league dark movie where batman forms the justice league dark by contacting constantine and fighting you know um a threat that the Justice League itself could not handle, and it showed that in in the in the movie. Um, I mm. I do think that I haven't seen it yet, so that's good to hear. It, it's an excellent, uh, excellent, uh, very well done. I do think that um, comic books in general and the movies in particular, the storylines and the threats are so apocalyptic. It's getting harder and harder to to kind of rationalize away why. It's not. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not It's not as integrated, more integrated than it we're seeing right now. Yeah. The impacts elsewhere in the world from some of the threats in both Marvel and DC are just so over the top that it has to be addressed in other forms. I think the comic books have an advantage in that they're serialized, and a lot of the fan base of comics are really dedicated to a few certain comics. They don't generally. I I don't know very many comic book uh, fans who buy, you know. 15, 16, 17 different comic books a month. There's, they tend to generally follow just very a few comics, and you can get away with that there. But in the movies where you have you know millions of people watching this, um, it's really it's much more difficult, I think, in two hours to explain away the lack of uh, addressal in other movies or on TV. I got that's kind of an interesting. Maybe this is a bit tangential. I was reading an article by uh, some guy who was like in Marvel's creative department in one of their heydays. And uh, they were moving like hundreds of thousands of comics a month. And these were selling for very cheap. And they and now he says that a lot of the decision making is driven by marketing. So that like they'll issue a comic and there'll be like six variant covers. So that collectors have to buy each of the covers and then the compilation and then the special edition with extra art. And it's like, and that was back like when he was doing it, you know, comics were, I don't know, 50 cents. And now they're like $4 a book. So like, how is a kid supposed to go down to the uh, drugstore and just pick up like their three favorite comics like we used to? So the number of fans who actually get their comic info from, I don't know, comics is much less than it was, I think, at least on the young people's side. Do you agree with that? Probably comics. The main problem is that comics have gotten pretty expensive, and you know I buy comics, but I can I can only buy very very few because I don't have much money. And even if I did, it's hard to just. I usually buy omnibuses. In other words, you know Justice League one through twelve. If they put it all together in one book, you know, because it's a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, I can't justify. Even if I made more money, I can't justify spending four dollars on something that I can read in fifteen minutes. You know what I mean? My, my kids are uh, very much into um, fantasy, science fiction. Not Lovecraft so much. They know all about. We play Cthulhu Wars and all about the monsters and whatnot. But when they read comics, they don't even think about buying a physical issue. They go on the web. So yeah, comicsology. Yeah. They, well. They follow like different web comics, like uh, what is it, Drummer King Court? 
uh, girl genius. Um, they are not really interested in the um, classic superheroes that much anymore. I, I just wonder if, like, uh, you, you always want the younger fan base to, to want to hook them early, and I just wonder what's going to happen and what this implies for, like, who actually is going to watch the movies? What, are, what expectations yeah. are they coming with? It's it's a collector's market now because when I was a you know I used to buy fifteen comic books a month. I bought all of Marvel, but they were only fifteen cents back then. Right. So it wasn't bankrupting me. Now well, it and also no, you know, they're all event driven storylines. So if you buy one comic, you end up having to go through everybody else's comic also. So you have to buy Spider Man, X Men, Thor and everything right. to get this entire story. And you're you know, you're a couple hundred dollars into one storyline now. Yeah. It's kind of like it, this uh, this um Watchmen um universe coming into the D C universe thing. You can't get it all in one series. Right. So which yeah. I don't know if you guys are into it to have enough to have an opinion about that. Well it's it's become a problem in that it's one of the reasons. So back in like eighty six, eighty seven, I quit reading regular books. I used to read. I used to go to the Seven Eleven and get my comics with my spare change, and I did that religiously. Mm-hmm. And then I just got bored with the giant crossovers that started coming up. So I started reading stuff that was like standalone and had a beginning and an end. The uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, The Crow, um, Grendel, Mage, right. uh, Warlock 5. Things that were, looked like they had condensed storylines that were going to you know, end. And therefore I could have an arc complete. You know... There are people out there who are desperate to collect all 5,000 issues out of there of Batman and Batman, you know, all the Batman tie ins. And good God, that's impossible. Yeah, you need, definitely need a spreadsheet. Do you um, think manga? Do you think the manga market cut into that? I know my kids are more obsessed with Attack on Titan manga than, right, because you than, know than it's regular gonna, comic books. You know, it's at least going to have an arc, right? You're going to be able to finish a storyline and know what happens to some characters. But you know, yeah. the, the problem with some of the other characters is that they just go on forever. And then, you know, when they when they screw up and they've made things so complicated or so unbelievable, they reboot the whole thing. Yeah, all yeah. that stuff never happened. Well, fuck you. Whatever happened yeah, to the like, regular uh, supervillain? <laughs> I mean, now yeah. I, once you once you fought the Beyonder, right? What right. else is after that? Uh, it's all down. It's all less than less than for anything you face after yeah. that, right? Well, we also have this is the, the problem. What I saw when reading them was when you make a supervillain recurring and he never dies. He, you you know he may die in one issue, but can he come back with some explanation? You lose some very satisfactory deaths. Mm-hmm. It was, or, or on the flip side, when it's a hero, you lose some very heartbreaking deaths. Right. 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 But I'll, I'll just use an example. Now, the early version of Magneto, which was no way like this guy who survived concentration camps. Right. Was a total bum. And there was a, throughout when he was introduced, he was beating the crap out of the toad, treating them as a punching bag anytime he was frustrated. And they had one thing in the event is where the toad turns on him and kills him. That was a great scene. But it didn't got room because he had to survive. Right. I mean, you could have killed him off and then had he had a son or a brother or, you know, somebody else was the whatever they did was Magneto. Speaking of reboots, uh, you know, DC Comics rebooted in 2011. And then they have this rebirth thing that they started last year, which they insist is not a reboot, but it's a reboot, kind of, you know? I do. So it's it's extremely complicated to understand what's going on with it, which I think is the opposite of what you want to do. 
Well, so apparently the idea behind the reboot is a marketing thing. And they talk about this and say, look, this is a perfect opportunity for people who aren't familiar with the comic, who don't want to get involved with the long history of what we've done before, to come in and start fresh. We're going to introduce the characters from scratch. Yes, fine, great. But it's also an opportunity for all your standby readers to walk away. Yeah, true. Everything I've invested in doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like Captain America in Hydra. Come on. I mean, yeah. That's just okay. I know it's a comic book, but that's just preposterous. I. Well, well, just in in fairness to what they did there, he 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 was his his memories were uh, altered or something. You know, he, he, like, he, he, he really wasn't part of Hydra. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah, saying. but it's offensive. It really I, is. I, you know, I think in real life, uh, the NFL uh, is actually sounding its death notes because parents are not going to let their kids play football because of the head injury thing. And you aren't going to have the same degree of, you know, young people coming up and fan interest. Now, I, I think this same problem where you cut off the young reader is going to affect DC and Marvel. Maybe they'll just migrate and strictly be a media production agency. You know what I mean? Not be mm. so much. Like, is, is Comic Con even about comics anymore? No. No, it's mostly a pop culture con. Uh, I sort of think that's what's going to happen. I read a, I read a very series of interesting articles by the guy who runs Mile High Comics. And uh, basically, they wanted to charge exorbitant amounts for a table, you know, for him to be able to set up and sell comics. And then they offered no special anything. Uh, they, they screwed up all his PR, and it was like, He's decided he's never going back because it was not worth it in terms of him actually selling, oh, I don't know, comics. I can't even imagine what it would cost to have a table at Comic Con. A lot of money. Be a lot of money. All right, so what about, uh, guys, what about The Gifted and Runaways? Um, I've watched The Gifted for like four episodes, and um, I don't know, I got fatigued. I, I'm just I'm really disappointed by most of the shows this this. Fall season, I gotta say. Uh, Kelly, what'd you think of them? I, I like both The Gifted and Runaways. Uh, Runaways took a couple episodes for me to get into it, but this last, I think, episode three, um, I, I'm all in now. The Gifted, I'm trying to figure out when this is taking place and how it might relate to Legion, which is also an X Men spin off, and if there's some way they can. Uh, connect those two. Well, it's funny because Legion is such a great show. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll help Kelly. I think the gifted is in the Logan universe. It uh, feels like it's yeah, sometime before Logan begins and after the last X Men film. Uh, but then, where does Legion fall in? Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. And I would say. The Gifted is well done, but potentially full of cliches from the X-Men. Like, it, 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 the danger was that show. I mean, the, the acting is fine, the action is fine, it moves you along, but I get a feeling, is this going to... I mean, Legion was different. This may be just what I've seen before on the X-Men. Maybe it's better done. But it's doesn't. It's not adding anything new. Yeah, X Men has built its own tropes, and this is very tropey of all the X Men stuff. You know, everything is a metaphor for racism and alienation. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? It just it does feel like right. I need another pill. Yeah, <laughs> you need more another drink. <laughs> Thanks. Don't mind if I do. I've seen the first three episodes of The Gift. Now, this is coming from a non-Marvel guy. Not that I don't. I love the most of the Marvel movies, but I don't really read the comics. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like I read DC comics. So, from a non-Marvel guy, in that sense, uh, I've seen the first three episodes of The Gifted, 
and I've been a little, life's been a little hectic lately, so I haven't seen any more yet. But I really enjoyed those first three episodes. Um, I didn't really think I would like it, and I was just, didn't have the mental capacity to read one day, so I tried the first episode. I think it was free or something on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it kind of sucked me in. Now, I haven't seen Runaways yet, so I can't offer a comment. Legion, I know you Marvel guys really love that, but I, I saw one episode, and I was like, screw this. I, just, I don't get this at all. Well, wow. when, I, when I first saw it, my, my reaction was, I'm either going to love the show or hate it. I don't know where I'm going with this. It eventually won me over. It it takes a while. Yeah. The, it's it's like it became Dr. Caligari. Yes. And that's difficult to mount. And so it, it took a little while. But uh, you know, when it first started, I'm going, what the heck is going on with this show? I couldn't follow the plot, and it all started to come together. So it takes a while. Runaways is sort of like that. It's you know, the beginning of the first episode. I saw it was a little too much Beverly Hills 90210. But I found the whole idea when they, the, the show won me over when they went into the parents. And basically, it's a, for, for me, what I'm getting from it is this is what it is to be a, a, a secret supervillain and have kids. Which yeah, they. It's an extraordinary they, concept. They're not, um, they're not all evil, they're, they're just supervillains. <laughs> well, to. I would say two of them are. Yeah, okay. So it's not a teeny bopper show? I got the sense that it was. There's, it is, um, but Rick's right. The most interesting part is when the parents are um, living their day-to-day -day lives. But I, uh, I'm not going to spoil two. I won't say who the two are. that are, well, so I, But, I, but I, I really like the African-American couple and the uh, Jewish-American couple. All right, can we just talk about Benjamin Handelman for a second? Because I have a real problem with this. On the live, live show comments, he writes, I missed Kelly so much. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Benjamin. Where did I go? <laughs> uh, well, you, you skipped out on, funny, funnily enough, you skipped out on two episodes. You were out of town two weekends in a row and told me you couldn't make it. And it, it was those two weekends that, because of some family issues, we didn't have shows. <laughs> oh, that's so, right. in other words, Benjamin says, "I didn't really miss the show, but I did miss Kelly." So, <laughs> I'm just kidding you, Ben. <laughs> I appreciate it, Benjamin. As well, your piece of people, Kelly, the rest of us didn't throw it even out. Even that, you know. Benjamin's a fifty dollar a month patron. If if everybody, if all of all the show fans were like Benjamin, I would never have to worry about my bills again. So, <laughs> thanks, Ben. Well, I think the other problem is that, you know, for some of the episodes that Kelly was here for, he was sober. That is very true. That is very true. I don't remember that. <laughs> Last. Yeah, my beer almost just came song. out of my nose. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> and there's like a the Dire Straits song. Um, Last time I was sober, man, I felt bad. Worst hangover I ever had. <laughs> There's a, there's a big difference between Kelly sober and Kelly drunk, and you know, obviously he started early tonight because he's wearing the smoking jacket. Yeah. You know. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. <laughs> no, I just hate That's you. That's not why we hate you. What what do you drink? Do you have a single malt? Oh yes, this is a Highland single malt today. By the way, I really appreciate no one commenting on my appearance and the fact that I look like a refugee from the 70s with this hair. You could use a haircut. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> hey, Mike, I didn't know it's, people it's still almost feathered time. their hair. <laughs> What's that? What'd you say? I said I didn't know people still feathered their hair, Mike. Well done. <laughs> it's natural. Thank you. It just David, happens. You know, it just does it on its own. In honor of David I don't Cassidy, even have, I, think I don't David even have Cassidy product in my hair. <laughs> Has anybody noticed the weird that shit my beard and mustache are doing? Well, it's gray. The, well, it's gray here, but then there's black here, and it's gray down here, but then there's black here. So it looks like I've got you know some. I don't know. It's salt and pepper. It's, yeah, but it's it's 
it's in the pattern and it's really freaking me out. I'm like, it's like Reed maybe, Richards. <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe you're an alien. I am. He's been a scroll all these years. Uh, a scroll. Okay, so what else do we have to talk about? Uh, oh, somebody, you guys wanted to talk about Punisher real quick too, didn't you? How, how's there, has everybody seen Punisher? I have no, not seen Punisher. No, 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 no. I'm about halfway through it and loving it. Loving it? Okay. I, 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 fantastic. I think it's great. Yeah, I, I've seen it all. I think it's fantastic. I'll just say it's a, it's a hard R-rated show. So. It's pretty brutal. I've seen about a third of it. Particularly near, near the end, it really gets violent, and it's got the steamiest sex of any Marvel Netflix show. So really worse than Jenna. Oh yes, and I would just that's all, all, all I'm saying. It's not for your kids. No, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's for good you to, as an adult. Know. Just know that it's not for your kids. That is good to know. Uh, <laughs> Benjamin says, as someone dealing with PTSD, I look forward to you guys' comments on Punisher. Maybe I should not watch it. That's yeah. it now. We're done. Huh? We're done. We're done for now. I hope he was okay. happy with those comments. <laughs> but the Punisher done right ought to be a TV MA or hard rated hard rated R series, and I, I think they did it right for for a superhero that has no real superpowers. He's just a badass. He's like a more violent Batman. Um, I think it's very well done. Yeah. Yeah, and I can see it now. Coming to a theater near you, The Punisher, rated G. <laughs> that that you know that was barely a comic book movie, and I don't mean that as a uh, criticism. But you know, it, is it in the same universe as all the others? No, it's got, it, a, it's yeah. got a major. It's got some uh, crossover characters, particularly one from Daredevil. Right. Yeah. yeah, I saw that in the trailers. Yeah, but that could have easily been. Uh, uh, a Jason Bourne movie. Okay. I'm not, that's not a criticism. I'm just saying it's you. You want it rooted in reality for that that character for that character to work. It has to be rooted in reality. So, um, did anybody see the Batman Harley Quinn animated? That doesn't interest me. I saw that. I previewed it for my kids. Good thing. Good thing, because oh my god! Really? So, I thought it was a kid one. Oh no, 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 no! No, it's what? it's a, it's a PG thirteen. Oh come on! <laughs> well, I mean, it, uh, that is actually the rating. It is that a PG thirteen. But I don't know how they got that, because all right, so they got a very juicy R rated scene. You're saying it's there's a lot implied. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot implied. Fifty Shades of Harley Quinn. Yeah. It's got a great double entendre. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Yes. I, I haven't seen it, so I'm just guessing it, it. You know, it was as it was mildly amusing. I would not let my kids watch it, but it was mildly amusing. Well, well, the I, thing that's one thing about kids watching. These things may go totally over your head when you're a kid. No. This well, won't. <laughs> I, not that I know what you're talking but I just want to say, when I watch the James Bond movies, Pussy Galore, I thought of Cats. <laughs> I didn't think of anything else. Or I don't understand. I, when I, saw that when I, I think was, of Cats. When, I, when I was 10 years old. But when I'm looking at it now, I'm saying, how did they get that by? I know it's from the book. True. Uh, Look, it was only 10 years ago that I found out that Afternoon Delight was about sex. So, you know. Wait, now what? The, the song, Afternoon Delight, you know. Is that it the, is? 70, the 70s song? The 70s song. Well, I had no idea. To, to get yeah. this back to what we really should be talking about, horror fiction developed because that was the sneaky way to get sexual commentary into Victorian novels. And did Dracula. you know that the, the, the Man With No Name song is about drugs? It is. <laughs> I rocked your world just now, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry, Rick, go on. But I just want to say, like, Dracula, Carmilla. Carmilla was the first uh, lesbian story, really, in fiction. I mean, in, in popular mainstream fiction. We can go back to ancient Greece, but I'm just saying, you know, if you look at 
modern era. There's a lot of stuff going on that's implied in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, child abuse may be at the core of Turn of the Screw. I didn't catch yes. that till very late. You know, I've seen, you know, Dark Shadows versions of it. I've seen uh, three movie versions of it. You know, like about 10 years ago, I saw one, and then it, it dawned on me what was really going on there. Yeah. So that's, you know, why we have things like H.P. Lovecraft. This is a way to introduce very controversial material, make it a horror story. And you can see that the Dunwick Horror did have some unusual sexual angles to it, if you could go in, deeply go into it. Kelly's making another salad. Why is, I'm reading between the lines on this. I think he's getting another drink. How many? That's how many me. of us as preteens, or at least for me, um, watched heavy metal? <laughs> I would never let my kids because I'm the ultimate hypocrite. But uh, <laughs> but you know, yeah. I I did watch heavy metal when I was like twelve. <laughs> it's not hypocrisy. You say to them, "I'm trying to help you avoid the mistakes that I made." That's right. But look, you know, on that note, Rich, it took me probably fifteen years. To figure out that Ula Tech was Cthulhu spelled backwards. Okay. Well, you didn't see. You you were hearing it. You didn't see it in the. Uh, yes, but you know. If you saw it on the printed page, you would know. Yeah. It's like how you put. Well, just since we're mentioning how you hear things, if you go into the HPL Historical Society, they give you a free download of a half-hour adaption of uh, the case of um, Monsieur Vladimir. Okay. From Edgar Allan Poe. Well, the facts in the case, I think the, I, I, I may not have the title exactly right, but we, it's the Vladimir story. And there are a couple, there are at least one mythos reference, which I'm not going to mention. But the hypnotist mentions something that sounds like is a car, uh, invocation and i'm thinking is he pronouncing ithaqua because i was trying to figure out what the heck did he just say and then because of the way they then and then later down the line they throw in a very direct lovecraftian reference hmm. i said he might have said ithaqua so you see, see some of us don't know how the heck you pronounce these things yeah how, how many of us knew how to pronounce Cthulhu when we first saw it in print? Well, yeah. we're still saying it wrong, but yeah. But actually, you say, the, actually, any way you say it is technically wrong because it's unpronounceable yes. by humans. Uh, actually, so it's, it's, it doesn't matter what you come up with. It's but, pronounced uh, Clu-Lu. Well, when it was first pronounced in the movie, which was the Haunted Palace with Vincent Price, the actor saying it, it was the Dr. Willett character from Charles Dexter Ward said Tulu. Well, Cthulhu, that's a great segue into switching topics. Um, now, I don't want to... One of the things that I think is a, is a mistake and unkind is when you criticize not just someone's work, but you criticize the person themselves. So that is something I definitely don't want to do in this segment. But... I think I've kind of ignored this for a long time. I think we've all kind of ignored it. But Joshi's kind of gone off the deep end with the criticism lately. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> you mean with I his... Mean, uh, I, his reviews always sound to me like, this person is an idiot, and he writes like an idiot. Yeah, you could sum up most of his reviews to be that, yeah. Um, um, I think that's 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 a feature, not a bug. Um, I, yeah. I uh, remember reading the rise and fall of the Cthulhu mythos, and that dates from like nineteen ninety six, something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, it's around there. And I, I read it maybe six or seven years after it was published. I think. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, and uh, he absolutely excoriates Brian Lumley, uh, saying, hopefully, I'm paraphrasing, hopefully this talentless hack will stop writing soon. 
Um, now, he, he takes Brian Keene to task recently. Yeah, he did. And the truth is, I don't enjoy Brian Keene's writing. I don't think his rising stories are of particularly well-written or interesting or compelling. But any communication I've had with Mr. Keene, like I... Like, I, I wrote him a few emails about Earthworm Gods. Remember that book? That was from 10 years ago or more. Uh, trying mm -hmm. to get at what Lovecraftian elements might be in it. He was very polite and enthusiastic and seemed like a really nice guy. I mean, why would you, why would you want to excoriate him? Like, this is the problem that I, I don't get. It's like, I write critical reviews. You know, I don't nearly do as much as I used to, but I, I hope... I hope I don't make the same kind of ad hominem attacks. I, and, and that's the difference. I, of all of us here, you've written the most reviews, I would think. And I, I've never read a Matthew Carpenter review that criticizes the writer, him or herself or herself, in any way. You, you, you might say, oh, I don't like this, why I don't like it which I think is valid. Every, you know, the opinions are valid. But where Joshi goes wrong is in, in the ad hominem tax. He goes wrong when he criticizes people. He's, he's downright mean, and then he accuses other people of being mean. And, and, okay, um, another problem I have is I don't get it because he is clearly erudite, um, a lot of what he writes is very interesting and well researched. Uh, I've enjoyed reading the essays by him that I've written, that I've read. I mean, I, I just don't know. This is something I just have failed to. You know, he he has written me. I've corresponded with him a number of occasions. He's never been. He is unfailingly polite and professional, and I just don't know. I don't know why. I mean, I don't understand. Well, he he claims that it's satire, but that's not a that's not a good excuse. That's not a good reason. So it kind of strikes me uh, saying all these incredibly unkind things about people, and then saying when they when they feel bad about it, saying, "Oh, it's satire." And then he he says, "Oh, it's satire." Don't you get that? It's kind of like one little kid bullying another little kid, and when the second little kid gets upset. The first little kid says something like, "Well, I was only oh, I was only joking. Can't you take a joke?" I mean, it's it's a very immature response. It's also sometimes how you say things. And just to get back to like the rising fall of the Cthulhu mythos, there was a line in there about Arkham, and Will Murray had a theory that it came from someplace in Massachusetts called Oakham, mm -hmm. and this he closely found legitimate evidence which disproves the theory. So rather than say this disproves the theory, which is a very polite way, it annihilates the theory that, you know, Will Murray proposed. Well, that's a little over the top melodramatically. My main reason for bringing this up is not to pound on S.T. Joshi, but to say that, look, I've got a platform here and say it's not okay pe to treat people this way. Now, do I think Joshi's going to listen to me? No, of course not. In fact, he's going to respond with something along the lines of Mike Davis isn't doing anything important and he's not going to be remembered a hundred years from now. So just, just to take that out as attack there. Um, you know, when he's saying things like on his latest uh, blog post, Meanwhile, the antics of my enemies, you got enemies? How do you have enemies? I uh, uh, continue to provide rich amusement. Their staggering inferiority to me in intellect and achievements is becoming more and more apparent with each passing day. But what has now become increasingly obvious is that they're really not very nice people. <laughs> okay, pot, meat, kettle. I, I, just, I really, I, you know? this whole thing makes me very sad. I'm not. I don't, you know, I like reading Joshi. I like reading the people he criticizes. I, when Bob Price um, made his comments at Necronomicon two years ago, 
I was very sad more than anything else. It's like these are the men who should be like the old brand masters, you know, that everyone like wants to hang around with and learn from. And I, I just don't understand why they can't be more pleasant. Absolutely. They, they could be they on an individual one on one basis. What do you know? They, they really are charming and pleasant. And I don't understand why they're getting into these public disputes. Yeah, well, they, it's pretty easy to be, you know, ST has been nothing but kind and charming from what I've seen in person. And, but yet when he's hiding behind his keyboard, he says the most unkind things. You know, what were you going to say, Kelly? I was going to say that, um, well, Joshi in particular could have gone down and been remembered as the man who uh, who kept Lovecraft's memory alive and his legacy alive and with all of his annotated versions and all of this stuff. And he could have helped usher in this this uh, new weird fiction generation. But instead, by uh, by fearing it and then going on the attack with most of it, um, he's negated any goodwill he had, and and you know he'll go down being remembered as you know a cranky old man yelling at clouds. Yeah, I think that's because, very well said. Because he he seems like he's, uh, and there is no doubt that his knowledge of Lovecraft is uh, staggering. But his. Uh, his willful ignorance of what is actually happening in the genre right now is also staggering. It, it's just, he, he doesn't want to know it. He's going to fight against it. And, you know, that kind of, that kind of makes it like with Matthew, it makes you feel very sad because here was this guy who was kind of a hero and, and now he, he has fallen. He keeps repeatedly shooting himself in the foot every time he makes a review he gets more people who think to themselves geez he's he's acting like an asshole right you know, and and I'm he, that, look let's not i don't want any misunderstandings here it, you don't have to like if you're a reviewer you don't have to like every book you read that's not what i'm saying it should be blindingly obvious that it's easy to write a review of a book that you don't like without saying unkind things about the author. That, that should just be blindingly obvious. It's, it's kind of like I'm saying, hey, ST, you know, the sky's blue, right? So. But these, these public then skirmishes that he gets into with these authors, and then he reviews their latest book poorly, I, you know, you have no faith in anything he's saying as a reviewer now because he's made public that he doesn't like this person and he's yeah. made it obvious that he cannot separate a person from their art. So now it's kind of like, you know, what are you doing? This is all you had left. Why are you, why are you screwing up your own legacy? There's sort of revenge um, critiques. Yeah. Revenge reviews, you might say. Can I, can I talk in a Lovecraftian sense sure. for a while about how much this all really means? It's like, you say, like, there's all this froth, and how many people are involved in this discussion, really? I mean, a couple hundred, maybe? Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same people who are always posting and commenting. It's like, what you count on is... Uh, at least as I would think as a producer of this art, is that there's going to be replenishing of the uh, pool of people who are interested in. Some people move on, some people stop collecting, some people, their interests change. You need constant, well, constantly want to bring new people in. Do you see what I mean? Well, he's right. sort of, and what I feel bad about is, okay, he's already said he's not going to participate in the World uh, Fantasy Awards anymore. He sent back his awards. And he had won several. I mean, he had done for his really meticulous scholarship. And then it doesn't seem like he's going to be participating anymore in Necronomicon. So what I'm getting at is like, 
how do you continue to generate an audience for your work if you deny yourself a venue? His audience these days seems to consist of his friends, you know, and some followers. Yeah, Matthew makes a great point. This is exactly what we were talking about earlier, Mike, is that this argument in no way helps you pay your mortgage. What do you get out of this? Right. You know, I... And, you know, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that you have to have written a great book. In fact, I don't agree with it, that you have to have written a great book or a good book or some great stories in order to be able to legitimately critique another writer. I don't agree with that. Matt Carpenter is a great example of someone who's not a writer who's done some really great reviews that over the years many people have counted on. All right, but when you open up the door, this is from his post, one of his posts attacking Brian Keene, where I think Stephen King said something nice about Brian Keene, and ST didn't appear to like it because he wrote, the idea that the author of Cujo and the Tommyknockers has any kind of standing as a literary critic is funny enough to make a cat laugh. Open that door when you've written something like The Assaults of Chaos, which was almost universally panned. I mean, nobody but his friends liked the book. And it's, I read it, tried to read it. I finally had to put it down. It was in my view, very poorly written, and I'm not in the minority, let's put it that way. Um, so I don't think that's a door he wants to open, that if you write a bad book, or what he thinks is a bad book, then you can't criticize someone else's work, or say a kind word about somebody else's work. It's hard to judge what's going to be a classic, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. who would have known, you know, We'd be reading Robert Browning, but not Elizabeth Barrett Browning, 150 years later. It's, but Stephen King is certainly a craftsman, and at his best, he writes, you know, exquisitely wonderful books and characters. And I think he is self-aware enough to know that some of the stuff he's produced isn't very good. But he certainly knows his craft because he's been very successful at it. This has not been an accident. After his no. first break, you know, it's like, so to say he's got no standing, well, maybe he's got an insight. Um, like, if I'm uh, listening to an orchestra concert and I'm with a friend who's like, a violin player in a different symphony orchestra, they might be listening to that music with very different ears than me and appreciate it on some level that I don't. I mean, I, this is very, I'm sure it's all very subjective, but when Stephen King reads something, he's not reading it from the perspective of someone who doesn't know how these things are constructed brick by brick. So I, I, I wouldn't be so dismissive. Well, and my, but my, my major point with that is, is that if that's his criteria, if that's S.T. Joshi's criteria for being a literary critic, that if you've written a quote unquote bad book, then you can't legitimately say this, other, this writer's a great writer, or I didn't like this book, or I did like this book. He, he doesn't want to open that door because by that same logic, he shouldn't be criticizing anyone's work. And their history is full of people who weren't particularly good writers, but contributed much to editing. Mm -hmm. And then thought, you know, and it's not like Lynn Carter, even though he, some of his scholarship had some holes in it, in the 60s and 70s, got a lot of stuff in the paperback of classic fantasy literature. Yeah, and, one of my and, Yeah, I mean... That's his legacy. He was not the best or most original writer. But he handled the publishing game, at least as far as the adult uh, fantasy series from Valentine, very well. I would not have read Clark Ashton Smith if not for Lynn Gordon. Well, again, my point, 
my point in bringing all this up about ST Joshi is more than anything I want to say it's not it's not a good enough excuse to say well it's Joshi being Joshi being unkind to people is not okay and if everybody out there lets him know that it's not okay then perhaps he'll stop I doubt it but perhaps he'll stop and more and more people need to let him know that it's not okay and I think people need to realize too that it used to be that what ST Joshi reviewed mattered I don't want this coming but it doesn't matter as much anymore if Joshi doesn't like a book that does not mean the sales are going to tank it, it just it doesn't. may it may mean the opposite actually yeah and if he likes a book by the same token it does not mean that sales are going to rise all you writers out there that are afraid for ST Joshi to say a bad word about you it does not matter what he says so that's about as plain as I can get it yeah, doesn't Mike, matter what he says it matters to his friends that's who it matters to yeah I would say you know as an English major myself and as somebody who edits professionally you know writing not not fiction but other types of writing I would say mm -hmm. that um, um, any first year freshman at a university who takes English and takes his liter their first literary criticism class knows that ad hominem attacks are pointless and they're downright mean because they don't really address the work itself except in the case where an author's life directly impacts or addresses the work you know the, the literature that that author writes right. now I will say that there are many different categories of 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 um, functions within literature right you have editors you have like a Farnsworth Wright you have a Maxwell Perkins with Fitzgerald F. Scott Fitzgerald you've got critics and you've got authors some can do one or two of those things uh, but most you know focus on that their specific areas and and I will say that literary criticism as much as uh, literary critics you know hate to admit it it's it's a soft not barely a soft science if even that it, it's not it's it's very subjective and it's very difficult to objectively you know say this work is bad or this work is good although I will say that in general it, it, it's easy to, to know a Beethoven when you see him right it's sure. easy it's easy to know a Fitzgerald or a Faulkner when you when you read them however I, I will say that um, literary critics uh, working in a very subjective field have to be very careful about how they talk about a work especially in this day and age ad hominem attacks especially in the age of social media go a lot further and are a lot more detrimental to the critic than they are to the author they're talking about those are great points rich um, Jeez, rich uh, whatever you're paying Mike you should double it I want you on here more often <laughs> exactly yeah. No, but um, it, you know, it, it, is, it is just an opinion. It is just an opinion, and some reviewers, ST included, spout off these reviews as if they're fact. They're one person's opinion. Sorry, Pete, what were you going to well, say? You know, to build on that, things like, I don't know, Moby Dick tanked critically when they came out. Lovecraft tanked. You know, he couldn't make a living as a writer. You know, mm -hmm. and... And we complain in retrospect about all the critics who read Lovecraft through the 50s and 60s and complained that he was a lousy writer. And we know that that's not true, but, you know, that was a, an opinion. Critics had that opinion. The most serious, there are lots of... Go ahead. You know, as you say, the most serious critic of the time, Edmund Wilson, dismissed him. Mm -hmm. It was like the... Uh, yeah. Uh, the dean of literary criticism at the time. Right. Didn't he call um, Lovecraft sick? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think he did. Uh, Colin Wilson, you know, disparaged Lovecraft and then was challenged by Daryl to write a story. And he went yeah. on to write three or four. And he turned That's around. He turned around in the assessment of Lovecraft. And I will say Colin, that readers... Colin, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Readers ultimately make or break an author, and the critics eventually right. fall in line. Right, right. Yeah. And, and and I will say to Kelly, uh, you know, when you said Joshi earlier that Joshi has read, you know, as well far more learned and at least in this than most than everybody else in this panel. I would argue back that you got most of the people on this panel probably are as well read as Joshi and other things. He's probably not as up to date on the current, 
you know, um, Lovecraftian output as, you know, some of you are. I would say everybody on this panel has at least read as much Lovecraft as Joshi, maybe not as many times, is that most of us, if not all of us, have at least read most of, you know, if not all of Lovecraft's work. I have. And I'm sure that, yeah. you know, most of you have. So it's not as if we're, we're uh, um, not capable of at least having an, uh, an informed opinion on on Joshi's statements. I think everybody on this panel, to one degree or another, has more than a, a an above average capability to put an opinion that, that's more relevant. Uh, uh, as, as do others that um, are doing their best to stay up on Lovecraftian fiction and weird fiction, new weird, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, not just us. Uh, and so I, I guess I want to say, look, Writing a review and saying you don't like the book and giving some reasons, that's fine. But stop with the ad hominem reviews. Stop attacking the writers. And this, he seems to like to attack people and say something along these lines that he'll finish up with, and this person's not going to be remembered in 100 years. You know, and the subtext is, I am, you know, and, but, but you're not, so you're not important. Yeah, but well, I would, I, would, I would argue that whether someone's going to be remembered in 100 years or not is not a basis to gauge how important what they are doing. Let me use my wife as an example. She is one hell of a dedicated high school English teacher. I mean, she is insanely dedicated, and her kids love her. Um, she changes a lot of she changes a lot of lives. She touches a lot of lives every school day. Will people necessarily remember the name Danielle Davis a hundred years from now? I would argue that they won't. But it doesn't mean she's not doing important work. Uh, she's touching lives that may reverberate uh, to a hundred years from now and further. But she's not necessarily going to be remembered. So it's whether you're going to be remembered or not in 100 years has no bearing on a person, has no bearing on the importance of your work. Well, and I, I don't understand why he keeps bringing it up. I have another comment. Um, okay, I'm a, a radiation oncologist, and we have a weekly tumor board where mm -hmm. the facts of the case are presented, the radiology, the pathology, and the history. And we've got to come to a conclusion about what is the best way to proceed. And it is not uncommon <laughs> for the doctors to go after each other. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You'd rather blunt, you know, that was a mistake, or this is a much better approach, or I don't agree with what you did there. You know, not throwing all the toys out of the pram, but on the other hand, it's like really significant professional disagreements in front of an audience. Okay, you can do this face to face over important stuff and have significant disagreements, quoting literature back and forth without being unprofessional. And right. it's a lot easier to be an excoriating critic of another person if you're not face to face. So I sometimes wonder what might have been said differently if two people were sitting at a round table. I don't know. It's, it's easier to get away with um, incivility if you're not, if you're just typing at a screen. And that's why when people describe ST in person, they say he's polite, nice guy. And I know that he is. I've talked with him several times. But when he writes these reviews, when he, when he makes these attacks on people, that is in essence what he's doing. He's hiding behind his keyboard. He, he's saying things that he has never said to the person, uh, to that pe person face to face. Well, so, um, let's face it, we'd, we'd really like to see him, because of his stature, act a little better than the other sure. people and just and just blow it off and you know it, it'd be uh the height of classiness for him to just not respond to any of this stuff but instead he you know he drops down to 
to whoever is the lowest in the ditch and and proceeds to to berate them there and it's just it's just distasteful i don't think it's too late for st to get his reputation back if he starts treating people right but the question is you know and stops attacking people you know and over time i think that could happen but i also don't have a lot of faith that he'll do it no i think it's too late you think it's too late well maybe i'm an optimist I think it's too late because uh, the people that he's attacking are much younger than him, and uh, that's what will be passed forward after he's gone. It's true. Night, Matt. Nope. Right. See you, Matt. See you, Matt. Matt's got to go make dinner. Um. Yeah. Oh, well, that's me being a Pollyanna, I guess. But yeah, you know, he's done a lot of damage. He's attacked a lot of people. There's no doubt about it. And, All the uh, more reason to be very clear, right, in your writing to make sure that they understand. If you can't have a face-to-face -face meeting, you really have to be very clear and concise or very direct in your writing. Because I know how emails can get misinterpreted because you, you don't get mm -hmm. the emotional ticks you get when talking with somebody face-to-face. -face. But So if you're going to write a piece of criticism, whether on your blog or that's in a book that you've written, you, it's essential that you be very, very clear direct and clear on what you intend to say versus what you think somebody might interpret. And ultimately it's the responsibility of whoever's writing it yep. to get their meaning across. That's right. The author is, is, is responsible. Right. All right. Well, that's enough also, about that. Also, yeah, he's, he's a big poopy pants. <laughs> well, you know when I said don't sink down to that level? Oh, are you talking to me? I was talking to you, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we have anything else we need to cover before we go? Anybody working on something that they want to bring up? I'm working on a film. What do you think about that? Wow, I don't, I don't know why you're on the show. You're too important to be here. Uh, I think sure. it's going to be as go. big a success as your last one. Oh boy, I wish. Yeah. That was uh, for those listening or watching and don't know about Kelly's last short film called The Package. Uh, that was that was a great short film. Let's just put it that way. Thank you. It's actually going to be available for those. It's on, yeah. um, I think, the 2016 uh, Lovecraft HPLFF disc that they put out, or maybe it was 2017. I, I don't remember. But it's, it's oh, available on one of those best of discs that the Lovecraft Film Festival puts out. Yeah, so Google that if you're interested. It's, it's definitely worth a watch. So what's your film you're working on now? Uh, my business partner, Eric Morgret, and I are working on a very low-budget feature film that uh, we have been putting together. And we had a few setbacks. We were planning to be shooting it uh, last month. And... His mother got very ill, and that pushed everything back. But we are uh, getting everything together. It looks like we'll start shooting in spring all around Seattle, Washington. What's the plot, or can you tell us? Uh, it's a horror film. It's kind of a most dangerous game with a little bit of a twist. So, What's the twist? I'm not going to tell you what the twist is. <laughs> He's told us enough with most dangerous games. <laughs> And then, yeah. of course, uh, we've got a new issue of Strange Eons coming out here. Um, actually, not before the end of the year, but just after the new year with a really, really cool Nick Gucker cover. Ooh, so. yeah. And for those who don't know, Kelly is the executive, executive, executive editor of Strange Eons. That's Eons with I, an A-E-O-N-S. So high Google priest. that and get some yeah. of those issues. Yes, the high priest. You should introduce yourself as that from now on. The High Priest of Strange Eons. In that I magazine. Hear, I want to hear what everybody else is working on. Uh, Pete, you working on anything? Uh, Pete just sent me a story for Autumn Cthulhu, too, that I haven't had a chance um, to read yet. Yeah, that's... Um, I sent a story to Salome for her Cthulhu S Speaks anthology. Um, what does he say? Um... The number you have reached. <laughs> if you'd like to make a sacrifice, press one. 
I, you'd like to you know, press too. This is it's a, I have I really do have this great story. I, it's not even a great story. It's a bad story idea where <laughs> where the Ma Bell takes takes Innsmouth to, to court for for to charge for all the collect calls to <laughs> collect call of Cthulhu. <laughs> but, you know, um, You're right. That's a bad story idea. It is, <laughs> but you know, it's yeah, it's, it's like anyway. Um, I'm supposed to be working on a story at, for which I have no idea for. Um, and I'm supposed to be working on the novel. And, uh, you know, for a long time, actually, I will, I will admit this right out. Admit it. Um, for the past probably 12 months, I have been in a funk that you might even call a depression. And I'm sorry. Yeah. That's not good, I know. And I've had a hard time writing. Yeah. So last week I finally sat down and I finished up the story for you and I finished up some book reviews and I sort of got back into the groove of things. So now maybe, maybe this funk and writer's block is gone and I can move forward on the novel. I hope so because that's frustrating and it's also – you know, depression is no joke, you know, yeah. not at all. Uh, oh, uh, Benjamin on, uh, on the live comments writes, whatever happened with chroma the chromatic court book Pete was working on? Oh, the chromatic court, the stories are selected. Um, they're pretty much line edited right now and mm -hmm. we're going forward. Right. <clears throat> When will it be out? Um, probably this year. I had to talk to the the uh, the publisher, but I think this year. Who is the publisher? That means the next month. Well, I'm sorry, 2018. Okay. Who who, who, who yeah. is the publisher? Uh, is it eight, 18th Wall? Okay, 18th Wall. Okay. Yeah. I have a story in there, and I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. So. I have something. Sure. Uh, I told you this before, I am writing, this is based on the Pantheon broadcast we did, I am writing a huge article on Lovecraft called H.P. Lovecraft and the God of the Abyss, which will be all the things we missed about Noden's God of the Lord of the Great Abyss and his work. Okay. Rick, yeah, that was that, a fun that, Patreon podcast. That, that is that's going to be cool. I want to I want to read that article because I think it, you're doing some really groundbreaking work there. Yeah, I'm going to publish that, right? Yes. Okay. Good. In one form or another. Right. I'll leave it up to you. Uh, yeah, and that was a good Patreon podcast. And if you're not a Patreon, uh, we really do. It, it supports me because this is my only job, but we really do have some very fun and very informative Patreon uh, podcasts, as well as um, fiction, Lovecraftian fiction stories in the podcast. Uh, me, Kelly and Philip Fracassi and I just did one recently on, um, I just blanked on the movie, Kelly. Gerald's Game. Gerald's Game. Mm -hmm. that, that was a hilarious podcast. <laughs> Poor Philip had been up since four that morning and then decided to have a couple of drinks before he came on to the podcast. And so, yeah, there was a lot of laughter in that one. Which is how you should approach any podcast, really. Or life. That we do. Yeah, I will say as a Patreon that there's a lot of fun and informative podcasts that you might not otherwise get a chance to uh, to, to listen to or watch. And uh Certainly, if you're at that level where you can be on once a month and get to talk to you guys, well worth it. Well, thanks, man. Uh, if you if you're if you want to get information about being a patron, just Google uh, Lovecraft Easy and Patreon, and it should be the first thing that comes up. So, um, what I, what I have coming up, I've got uh, several more books coming up in the next few months. One of them is a story by Joe Pulver that I'd like to get out fairly soon because, you know, he's absent being sick and everything. And I, I know his fans and friends miss him. It would be nice to have a new Joe. Uh, so, um, 
that's about it, I think. So uh, I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving, and we weren't going to do a show this Sunday, but I'm glad we did. Yeah, me too. This was fun. Great to see everybody. Yeah, good to see you guys. Except for you. All right. Huh? Except, except for me. <laughs> I thought he said well, except for Kelly. <laughs> I believe we're going to have John Langan on the show next week. Uh, I believe we're going to have John Langan on the show next week. So um, thanks everybody for listening and we will talk with you next week.